Despite the Industrial Revolution, Imperial Conquest, and International Economics, there are still some hunter-gatherer tribes that are essentially uncontacted, such as the Centenalese in the Bay of Bengal. This tribe is known for their hostility to outsiders, and it is strictly illegal to attempt to contact them, because, among other reasons, they are not immunised against diseases. But in 2018, Christian missionary John Allen Chow said, Nah, they just need a bit of Jesus in their life and so he paid local fishermen to bring him to the island. <laughs> and it went exactly as you'd expect. Do you have a moment to talk about our Lord? Yeah, Chow unfortunately ended up getting himself killed. But the good news is that he didn't go away empty-handed. He won a Darwin Award. A Darwin Award is an accolade given to those who, quote, improve our gene pool by removing themselves from it in the most spectacular way possible. But why am I mentioning the Darwin Awards, you might be thinking. Well, on the 20th of September, Area 51 is hosting what I'm calling the Darwin Olympics. Beginning as a joke to search for extraterrestrial life, and developing into something that might just happen, over 2 million people have said that they are going to storm the top security military facility. And I'm calling the event the Darwin Olympics for obvious reasons. One could say that the difference between the Olympics and the Darwin Olympics is that in the Darwin Olympics, the gun goes off at the end. Down. All right, let's go. Damn it! So, in celebration of all things stupid, and in a vain attempt to capitalise on a trending keyword, I've teamed up with Thomas Westbrook, Holy Kool-Aid, to create two videos. One that very much deals with Area 51, which you can find on his superb channel, and one in which we challenge one another to debunk the most craziest, hilarious conspiracy that we can find. Are you ready for this? Bring it on, bro. What we got? <laughs> oh, <fuck> off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> oh, that's amazing! <laughs> but to spice things up a little, we think that you should decide which of us wins the category of most craziest conspiracy and best debunk. This is yes, they can stop you all. Alrighty, I'll go first. The video that Thomas has challenged me to debunk is titled Mermaid Body Snatcher, and uh, see for yourself. I need more information about the deadly water spirit. I'm told of a more recent fatal attack that the whole community agrees is the work of the water mama. My husband was lost. I think he was disappeared going, by going up the river. He'd made this journey many times before. I was waiting for him. I spent one day, next day, nobody. They found the boat now, somewhere down the river. I believe that water mama has took him away. Some one of them mermaids then carried here. What does the water mama look like? They are people. But they have like a fish tail. Like and they have long hair. And what color? White people, white people's skin. Yeah, that's right, killer mermaids. Around the world, legends tell of ships wrecked and sailors drowned, lured by the irresistible beauty of mermaids. The entire five minute clip consists of a villager in Guyana, South America, making extraordinarily unscientific claims, whilst a British dude credulously listens as unskeptically as humanly possible. But with no actual witnesses, I need to rule out any other possible explanations. No sign of any fight. No. No. Okay. What's the water like there? Is it, is it rough? Is it deep? No. There's no way you could say he drowned or he got deep water, so it, the, the water was very shallow. Okay. Indeed, in and of itself, the clip is absurd. 
But after doing my research, I find it to be actually very misleading. And it's for this reason, I would wager, that the comments are so saturated with morons. The clip is evidently a segment from episode 10, season 6 of River Monsters, which is hosted by the angler and biologist Jeremy Wade. And the premise of the show is genuinely fantastic. Wade traverses the world's rivers to uncover the true beasts behind mythological monsters. Over the years, I've learned that behind stories of fantastical beasts, there's often a real flesh and blood creature. In fact, I'm surprised I hadn't heard of it yet. It's well up my street, especially considering that it's one of the most viewed shows on Animal Planet and Discovery Channel. But hey, I've now got myself a new series to cane. Now, Wade strikes me as a genuinely awesome person, and I'm already a fan, but I'm not letting him off the hook that easily. His logic is often suspect, to put it nicely. For example, he very frequently begs the question. If I can track her down, perhaps she'll be able to give me some clues about the identity of her husband's attacker. Indeed, by saying that he's looking for clues about the identity of the attacker, he's presumed there was an attacker. And in case you think I'm being a bit nitpicky, here's another example of him committing the same fallacy. But the cast-off clothes tell me that whatever took him didn't pull him from his boat. It waited until he was in the water before it struck. By using language such as, it waited until he was in the water, Wade is presuming an agent-based conclusion. It's rather like when theists say, who created life? One can't just presume it's a who rather than a what. Another area in which Wade's logic is suspect is how easily he discounts viable, plausible theories. Very puzzling indeed, this particular disappearance. A canoe floating down the river with nobody in it, but this pile of clothes. No sign of any scuffle, any disturbance, which seems to rule out foul play. Except it doesn't, does it? Criminals very often clear up after committing a crime for the exact reason of removing suspicion of foul play. And it's not like the Guyanese have a rigorous forensic police force, is it? Given what we know, there is no way that we can rule out foul play. Um, the water there, um, shallow, calm, which seems to rule out drowning. But again, it doesn't. Every year, 5,000 people die in the bar for crying out loud. All it takes is a moment of low blood pressure while standing up, an undiagnosed condition, or a simple misplacement of one's foot, and bam, one is face first, unconsciously in the water. What's more, on top of these considerations, we should note that Guyana's ecosystem is notorious for having some of the world's most ferocious marine predators, such as black piranhas, which are known to tear chunks of flesh from victims and even sever bone, caiman alligators, which grow up to 15 feet in length and are notorious for killing locals, and arapaimas, which grow up to 12 feet in length, can weigh up to 450 pounds and swim at speeds of 30 miles per hour. And their scales look a hell of a lot like how people depict mermaids. But I don't want to give Wade too much heat, as he was making a documentary with the purpose of entertainment. I will say, however, that his trust in personal anecdotes is a bit jarring, but again, perhaps it's all part of the show. Ultimately, Wade concludes that the monster behind the folklore is probably Arapaima, and I have to say, I share his conclusion. A river monster as deadly as any beast of folklore. And if you caught a glimpse of something this size, colour and shape appearing on the edge of your vision, your mind could fill in the gaps. And I especially appreciate him giving a nod to the phenomena known as pareidolia. But as for the specific case of the fisherman who went missing, I think it's more likely that he slipped, hit his head, drowned, and then nature relinquished what's hers through the medium of piranha dance. In any case, Occam's razor tells us that the chance of the cause being a half-fish, half-human is remarkably unlikely. The existence of such a creature would, for example, overturn and contradict centuries of anthropology and biology, and it would have been nice if Wade, a biologist, would have hammered this point himself. But again, the dude seems to be an absolute legend. So over to you, Thomas, and the uh, Flintstones. Good luck. Hello, my fellow apes. Thomas Westbrook here. Thank you so much, Steve, for letting me be a part of this, and thank you, viewer, for joining us. The title of the video Steve sent me is Did Dinosaurs Build the Pyramids? Let's take a look, shall we? In 2013, archaeologists discovered a hidden collection of papyri, documents written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs dating back 4,600 years. Professor Nabir al Samud says these documents reveal just how the pyramids were constructed. 
He says the pyramids of Giza were built by dinosaurs. Okay, he's off to a really bad start considering that the earliest pyramids were constructed 66 million years after the last dinosaurs went extinct, with the exception of Neornithian birds that is, but we'll keep watching. Lending support to his claim are images in ancient Egyptian art. Their art is known for its accuracy, particularly in representing animals. It has therefore long perplexed historians that the earliest Egyptian art depicts these strange creatures. Called serpopards, they only occur in ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian art. There is no denying that they bear a striking resemblance to sauropods. Egyptians, known for their hyper-realism, would never depict anything abstract or odd. Ignoring for a moment their drawings of this lion with a crocodile face and jackal-headed Jerry over here, the serpopard is actually a portmanteau combining serpent and leopard together. Serpapard. With their extended necks and swirling tails, only their cat-like heads distinguish them from dinosaurs. And their legs and paws and twisting poofy tails. If you take away their necks, they look exactly like wild cats. One of the oldest examples of serpapard art, the Nama palette, dating from before 3000 BC, shows them being reined in by human handlers. This suggests these gigantic creatures were tamed by humans. And this depiction of crocodile face harvesting this little beta cuck's organs is proof that Crocodile Dundee hadn't been born yet. This is a depiction of legend. Egyptians didn't tame dinosaurs, and this jug painting of Theseus isn't proof of minotaurs. Then in 2014, another remarkable discovery was made in Egypt. The remains of a new type of sauropod were found. Called Paralatitan, it was up to 90 feet long and weighed as much as 70 tons. And dates to around 95 million years ago. Seeing as the oldest pyramid in Egypt was built about 4,650 years ago, the magnitude of this error is the equivalent of calculating that the moon isn't a quarter of a million miles away, but is actually right down the street next to your nearest Chuck E. Cheese. What better way to heave the massive stones to the heights of the pyramid's peak than with the second largest dinosaur to have ever lived. Okay, but good luck taming a gigantic 70 ton monster with a brain the size of one and a half walnuts that went extinct 95 million years before you were born. It's the 21st century. Do I really need to point out that the Flintstones is not a documentary? Now, up until this point, I've been addressing the claims put forth in this video, but this video Steve sent me actually addresses and debunks this claim at the very end of it. So props to them. I honestly wasn't expecting that. They point out that when researching this video, we could find no evidence that Professor Nabir al Samud really exists. The first mention of him seems to have been in the World News Daily report, a purportedly American newspaper based in Tel Aviv, in Israel. It is often considered satirical and Zionist, and has been accused of being fake news. It could well have created the character of Professor Al Samud as a joke at Egypt's expense. He goes on to reveal that the man who actually translated this Egyptian papyrus is Pierre Talle, and according to him, there's no mention of dinosaurs in it whatsoever. The sad thing is that I genuinely know young Earth creationists who believe that dinosaurs and humans coexisted, and the dinosaurs were domesticated and even brought on the Ark, which is an even crazier idea to debunk. But here's the thing. Just because we don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt which method the Egyptians used to build the pyramids, it doesn't mean that we don't know that they built the pyramids. It wasn't slaves, it certainly wasn't dinosaurs, and it probably wasn't aliens either. But Steve and I will cover that topic over on my channel. For the sake of time, I'll have to do a separate video breakdown of all the things that we do know about how the pyramids were made. But for now, thank you kindly for the view, and I will hand you back over to Steve. Cheers, Thomas. It's always a pleasure to work with you. So which of us chose the best conspiracy for the other to debunk, and which of us did the best job of debunking it? Let us know in the comments section below. Oh, and in case you're going to Area 51 to party, however drunk you might get, however high, please don't do anything stupid. But whether you're going or not, be sure to check out mine and Thomas's collab on his channel dedicated to the event. There are some weird things in Area 51. I'm Stephen Woodford, and as always, Thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. Until next time, my fellow apes. Until next time.